welcome in the Attorney General for the state of West Virginia and candidate for governor, Patrick Morrissey. Patrick, good morning to you, sir. Hey, good morning, Rob. It's good to be with you today. Great to have you with us as well. I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to spend some of that time with us. So I'm not sure if you've been following along. I know you've got your own busy schedule to deal with as to what's been going on in Jefferson County, West Virginia, where they recently passed an ordinance uh, dealing with the restriction of uh, attendance of minors, which I think we all think is a good idea, at uh, shows, adult, what they call adult live performances. And we've talked to the county commission president. We've talked to the county commissioner who was uh, Jennifer Kraus, mostly in, in charge of writing the ordinance. And during that discussion, she mentioned that she consulted with your office on the writing of the language of that ordinance. Attorneys in, in your office uh, at one point um, apparently gave her advice on this particular ordinance one way or the other. Does your office uh, get involved in that sort of thing, Patrick? And did you have any involvement uh, with it or your attorney? Yeah, so, I mean, we have conversations. We didn't issue a formal legal opinion, but, you know, we talked to a lot of people about some of the rules of the road, and that's what happened here and what happens, quite frankly, um, every day across the state. But we're always sensitive to know that uh, our role is to serve as the chief legal officer for the state as a whole. And we always distinguish between formal legal opinions and conversations that we have. But I think substantively uh, what folks are trying to do is zero in on obscenity. And uh, that is, is clearly permissible under the law. I haven't focused on the details or the specifics of the ordinance. I haven't read this specific ordinance yet, uh, but at least based upon the broad understanding, uh, I think that there's an effort to focus on obscenity and explicit sexual conduct. And I think that uh, from that perspective, if, it, if it's tethered to uh, protecting kids and focusing on obscenity, then I would believe that that's something that's got a good chance of being upheld. But as I said, uh, we didn't write the language. I haven't, you know, uh, looked at all of the the details, so I can't give you a formal opinion. But uh, I, I say we have had conversations, and I think that is the focus is on obscenity. That's a much uh, cleaner place to be than some of the other ideas that are out there, which at least might be subject to First Amendment challenge. So did you specifically have the conversation, or was it more attorneys on your staff? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I had a conversation. I think some folks um, in my office have had conversations. You know, we didn't write the, the ordinance. But, yeah, we, we had conversations. But as I said, we always are clear that we try to be helpful so folks understand uh, what's going on uh, with the law. There are current cases nationally uh, that are being challenged, so we're following that uh, closely. But uh we so i would say that we we talk all the time to people about various legal issues uh but that's just different than a formal legal opinion john gilstrap i know you have a question on this yourself i do um commissioner kraus was very specific that the ordinance does nothing to stop the performance live performance of obscene you know whatever the language is that can still exist all that it does is it prevents um children, for parents bringing their children to a show that is deemed to be obscene or, or disgusting or, or whatever. You know, and, and the question I posed to her, and I pose it to you too, as, as a creative guy, I write books for a living, um, people's judgment on, uh, on what is and is not obscene kind of goes with Potter Stewart's advice way back in the day, right? It, with pornography. I know it when I see it. It seems right. to me that, that this sets up a lot of of uh, a lot of upset people claiming that this thing is obscene so therefore we need to send the kids to cps or we need to you know put put the owners find the owners because somebody said use the f-bomb in a show um what is is any Listen, of that I, actually I think, legal well look i i've been really clear that the code in west virginia uh, does permit this focus on obscenity, and that's some of the explicit sexual conduct. I think that uh, when there are ordinances to that effect, I think that becomes in 
on the more protected zone. Now, how something gets applied may be very, very different. But a lot of these issues are always subject to court challenge. We know that's been happening for a long time. You guys may remember the seven dirty words. You know that uh, pornography, you know it when you see it. So this is the area that's going to be subject to challenge. And so what I would say is uh, traditional obscenity, the lewd, the, the explicit sexual conduct, that I think that you can look at and say, yeah, that's an area especially when you're trying to protect kids, you're in a much safer zone. Without having looked at the, all the details of the ordinance um, and or as someone who may ultimately get involved in that, uh, I would want to say, well, I'm going to go through and, and pursue it. But uh, I think based on the conversations I've had, I, I think that my, my understanding is that the intent is good and they're trying to accomplish uh, positive things. But as I said, I would have to go through the particulars of the ordinance uh, before talking in more detail on it. Yeah, I mean, nobody prosecutes intent. People prosecute the, the letter of the law, quite literally. Um, I, I just, you know, I used to, quite honestly, and happy birthday, Chris, my son's birthday. Um, I used to take my son to R-rated movies before he was he was of, of age um, because, you know, because I, I wanted to. And he was okay with that. And we were okay with that. To me, that's the same as if I, I want to take my kid to something that is deemed obscene, and I don't know what that word means, it just seems to me that this usurps parental rights and responsibilities to make a decision for their own, especially since well, the ordinance I, does nothing you know, to stop I, I the performance. So that may be one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is I know that more broadly there's been a great deal of discussion and pushback as to various arms of government in terms of what kids are being taught and uh, that the parents have really lacked control. Uh, so that has been some of the counterpunch that we've seen. And I do know from discussions I've had with folks across the country uh, that that's been a great deal of concern. So, uh, as I said, I don't know all the details of all the particulars coming out, but I will say this. I think that there's been a real goal to protect kids and to make sure that they're not subject to uh, some of the craziness that we have seen over the years. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think there are, there are counterbalancing issues here and that they have to get, uh, they have to get resolved. So uh, I understand the point that you're making, but at the same time, I, I do think that we have to be always looking to be protective of our kids. That has to be done the right way. It has to be done in a manner consistent with the First Amendment and the case law, and certainly uh, that's what we'd recommend to anyone. John Bodwell. My, uh, my big question is to ask for a prediction. How many groups that are made up of acronyms do you think are going to jump on and, and sue against this law? I, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, um, I haven't seen a suit yet, and uh, I think that they may jump in, they may not. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but we will take a look. As I said, you know, my role is that of the state attorney general. So I evaluate, I watch, and uh, we'll see how this uh, plays out. Uh, but these do need to be crafted, crafted carefully. Um, but I, I do think that there is an avenue for local counties to engage in terms of their efforts uh, to protect kids. Uh, but whether someone, someone steps up based upon how the ordinance is applied, you know, I will leave that to them. I can tell you on the state level, we get sued by practically everyone, and half these cases seem to be frivolous um, because there's just a lot of money ready to challenge these cases. Our batting average has been very high, especially at the West Virginia Supreme Court. So, uh, I mean, there always seems to be someone willing to sue and occupy time and space in our legal system. You know, well, I, go ahead, John. Oh, I, I would think that, that based on, on what I've read about it, that, that groups will sue just because they're not going to want to they're not going to want to see this stand and see that, you know, this could go to to other jurisdictions in other states and go all over the place. Um, but hopefully, uh, hopefully the, the law of, of the local. I mean, it's it's sometimes people should have control over their local communities. Uh, this is Gail Strap again to you. To your knowledge, is this a problem in West Virginia? Are we are we trying to scratch an itch that 
doesn't yet exist, or is this fixing a problem that we already have? Listen, I, I think that one of the uh, the tools that states have in our constitutional system and that localities have is they have the ability to address issues that may uniquely affect them. So my understanding that this went through the, the county commission, and a lot of times people get asked questions, is this something that's a problem right now? They asked that question several years ago with respect to men playing in women's sports, right? This came up, and everyone criticized the legislature. Why are you doing it, getting out in front? And then what you saw is Leah Thomas, you saw the NCAA Women's Swimming Championship, and these biological males are competing in women's sports. And everyone said, well, this is terrible. Well, West Virginia had a law in place, and now we've been in court litigating. We won at the district court level, then we had it flipped out in the fourth a circuit that we're litigating on the topic. So uh, I can't speak to every issue that's arising, you know, in the counties. And, and guys, I would also say that we'll always evaluate all of these county issues as it may become relevant for the state to weigh in at some point in terms of through my office as to the legal issues that are involved. So, but when we do that, we do that after, you know, close review and evaluating the direction legally that the state wants to have so uh, i'm not going to question every county for what they're trying to do i i do think i know jennifer her motives i think are very good in terms of one of protecting kids just said i can't speak to all the issues or what's going on or um, any particular efforts that are being targeted but um, i do think jennifer's um, heart's in the right place yeah patrick i would ag- i think all of us agree we don't want children exposed to some of the things that they are exposed to, especially when it re, in regards to pornography, uh, overt, explicit things and acts. I, I don't think anybody in this room specifically thinks it's a great idea to have you know nine-year-olds in general exposed to those sorts of things. Um, I, I think the concerns we have would be from the feedback and the interviews we've done in regards to some of the things uh, that can are, are written into this law and how it will be enforced and what some of the consequences are. Uh, because, uh, as John said earlier, a, a lot of this stuff is uh, is opinion-related. Well, I, I think that's obscene. Uh, therefore, take those people's kids away from them. Uh, we get into an interesting scenario with that. But let's change topics and uh, go to fentanyl. Recently, you joined a coalition urging the Senate to permanently classify all fentanyl analogs as Schedule One drugs. Can you tell me about uh, about this and why it's not already, not already scheduled there? Yeah, absolutely. So we are, are urging uh, the Senate to immediately pass a halt fentanyl act and uh, ensure that these fentanyl al- analogs are classified as Schedule One drugs, which is going to give law enforcement even more tools to crack down. Uh, on the epidemic. I think it stops the flow, or at least will reduce the flow. Nothing's going to stop this flow of the dangerous drugs that are developed to imitate fentanyl. And uh, we know that the House of Representatives recently passed this bill, and a lot of the AGs, we got together and we're urging uh, the Senate to pass this as well. And as you guys know, I've been talking a lot about pushing back on of fentanyl that's coming in, especially through the southern border. It comes in uh, within the ports of entry. It comes in between uh, the ports of entry. And these are ingredients that originate in China. They go to the Mexican drug cartels. Products get finished. They come into the U.S. and eventually make their way up to West Virginia. It's a real um, real concern. And so we want to weigh in. And there have been a bunch of AGs who have been constantly looking at different ways to uh, classify fentanyl uh, as the dangerous drug that it can be, but also to push back on all the illicit products uh, that's most certainly coming in uh, from down in our southern borders. So this is an important issue. I am going to continue to push and also to classify fentanyl as a weapon of mass destruction. I know that uh, the president's national drug czar was in uh, Charleston, just last week, and I mentioned that to him and pushed him uh, for uh, pushing the president on that in order to get some of the additional resources that we think are needed. And uh, we need to keep this pressure up. People are dying. They're being slaughtered. And uh, we have to do everything we can to try to stop that. And so I look at these uh, tools and these different provisions as just 
yet another way to help the process, especially in West Virginia, which is the number one uh, drug overdose death rate from fentanyl in the nation. Are we taking this problem as seriously as we should be on a holistic national level, Patrick? No, no, we're absolutely not. And it, it bothers me to no end. And I can tell you, gentlemen, I, I brought a lot of the families together who had a loved one lost to fentanyl. Uh, and we came together last November and we spent a lot of time talking through these issues. And, you know, one of the great concerns that these folks had is that uh, there hadn't been enough attention uh, paid to it. Uh, I've tried to really elevate the focus on this through my office. And obviously my colleagues of the Florida Attorney General and others, we've been not only talking about it a lot, but weighing in with specific ideas of things that could make a difference right now. And we've had a conference with a lot of the law enforcement in our state just a few weeks ago about some of the different tools that we can use and, and better help provide law enforcement to make sure they have the resources to address it. One of the issues that came up, we had Eastern Panhandle law enforcement uh, on that conference call, is people were, are always very concerned about uh, the lack of uh, state police and some of the lack of law enforcement resources in the EP, in part because, as you guys know, you look at some of the pay scales and the ability to, uh, to attract people in the EP, and it's tougher. It might be tougher compared to a Loudoun or a, um, out in Frederick or Washington County. Why? Because, I mean, people march and go in a direction in part based on financial incentives. And I think we have to be mindful of that. And that's why one of the things I talk a lot about every day is we have to be competitive with all the states that we touch. And that includes when we're trying to hire for uh, state workers. That includes when we're setting these policies up and we're trying to uh, make sure that all parts of our state uh, can compete with the states that we touch. And um, I think this is, you know, all tied in together uh, because we definitely need some additional assistance, law enforcement. We need more prosecutorial help from Merrick Garland. We need help from Anthony Blinken, our U.S. Secretary of State, who I think is not focusing adequately on this uh, in terms of raising this with China and Mexico. So I, I really wish uh, this president would make this a priority. It's an area of abject failure right now. It's it's one of the things that bothers me most about what's going on in D.C. Jonathan? Well, yeah, Patrick, I mean, it's it's flowing in here like crazy. Is there, I, I saw, and I, I can't recall the name, a Republican congressman yesterday put forth a, a an order of to try to to impeach Biden as well as Kamala Harris, and one of the big things was the border crisis and the the drugs and everything coming in. If did you see anything about that? You know, I I didn't see that uh, before getting on the uh, phone with you guys today. But I will say this: you know, when the word impeachment gets thrown out, you know, usually I kind of yawn, and and there's always some people that focus on that. Uh, you know, we have elections for a reason. Let's focus on the election. However, what we have seen or what we haven't seen at the border is so grotesque and uh, terrible on every level. I understand why people are talking about that with the Biden administration. Look, Mayorkas has been an unmitigated disaster. You know, we've sued the, sued the Homeland Security Department. We've been trying every which way to get the attention of the feds to no avail and I will say this, uh, during the Trump administration, you know, people can be critical, people can be partisan. He would have meetings with Republican and Democrat attorneys general, and we'd all get together. And I'm not telling you that there wasn't some tension back and forth uh, between the, the different groups, but there is no effort, and I mean no effort, uh, from the Biden administration from a law enforcement perspective or the AGs to uh, try to have some common ground. And this issue of fentanyl and the issue of drugs absolutely should be common ground. This is not a partisan issue. People are dying at a level that is off the charts, and everyone needs to focus on that. So uh, given the, the flow of, of drugs across the southern border, what are your thoughts on Governor Justice's decision to send the National Guard troops down to the uh, southern border? Look, I actually applaud that. I think that every time that you uh, can focus attention on the border 
it's a good thing, and everyone needs to do their part uh, to help those who are on the front lines. West Virginia feels the impact of the border uh, by seeing all the drugs that, that are coming in. And so I think that uh, when you can show support to your sister states for what's going on, that's most certainly a positive thing. And uh, I think we have to do even more, put more attention on that. Look, what's happening right now is the fentanyl is coming in. It's washing into our, into our country. It's dirt cheap. And so the price is what makes it so attractive, and there's so much volume available, and that's what makes it so dangerous because it's easy to smuggle in, and we need to be looking at all tools. I, I think that uh, when you send 50 people down, you know, you may say, well, that's just symbolic, but I think a lot of the states are sending folks down, and I do think that there's value in a lot of the states coming together and trying to help out because the feds are – absolutely failing in their jobs and this shouldn't have to be states stepping up but i think anytime that happens i applaud that and i want to put even more time and uh, resources in especially on the fentanyl side in west virginia because that's what's really been a plague and a pox on our house and the deaths are just way way too high here in west virginia patrick before we run out of time i want to cover the supreme court appeals decision thursday vacating the preliminary injunction issued by a Canal County Circuit Court against HB 2012, empowering professional charter school board uh, to authorize charter schools in the state. So this ruling finally came uh, recently, and it backed up what you had said initially. Yeah, so uh, this was interesting, and, and we had weighed in because there was a plaintiff that sued the governor. They sued uh, the Speaker of the House, the Senate president, we're trying to get an injunction on our charter school law, and uh, we now know that uh, that was improper, that there was you know, a party, the state's authorized through the professional charter school board uh, to take various actions on charter schools. And, you know, this goes to the, it's another case where, you know, we look at it, we scratched our head, and we think, why the heck are these folks going after these parties who really have nothing to do with the relief that's being sought. And we have to go into court. We have to defend. We intervene. And ultimately, the Supreme Court agreed with us that uh, they were going after the wrong parties. And so right now, charter schools continue. And we think charter schools are a positive reform. But, you know, there are a lot of cases that just get filed. And I scratch my head. And maybe I've been at it for a while. And you could sense the the kind of uh, cases that don't have much merit from the ones that do. Uh, But it really is kind of disturbing because we know the speaker and the Senate president, uh, once a bill passes and it uh, becomes law, that they shouldn't be the named parties. And the governor makes the appointment decisions for these boards, but doesn't then control uh, all of the actions. So I think it's just incumbent on people before they go into court to take a little bit of time to get it right and make sure that they're not wasting taxpayer money. And finally, it uh, also is a Supreme Court ruling regarding uh, sovereignty over water and land. You were involved in a landmark water case helping the state of West Virginia and specifically this area earlier in your tenure as AG Patrick. What was this latest decision? Yeah, absolutely. So this actually does affect a lot of people. Uh, in Jefferson County and Berkeley County, Morgan, Hampshire. So uh, there has been this hotly debated uh, topic over the last number of years over something called the Waters of the United States Rule. Now, those uh, might remember growing up that uh, as you read the Constitution, you would say that the federal government had authority to regulate interstate waterways, right? But if, it were in, if the waterways were intrastate in nature, then that's something that's handled by citizens, by the localities, by the state. And everyone kind of knew those rules. Well, as time has gone on, there's been a broader effort to expand the jurisdiction of the federal government and apply that interstate power and uh, the navigable federal waterways to expand it, and in some cases going to your backyard ditch, to your ephemeral stream, and to try to uh, sweep as many quote-unquote wetlands um, into the mix. Well, these 
efforts to expand federal government power and jurisdiction have been met with swift rebuttals for a long time. Uh, I've been fighting against the Obama and the Biden waters of the United States rule now for, it seems like forever, but since 2013, 2014, and we've won almost every case. Just recently in the Sackett case, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, where we were the lead state amicus, we led the 25-state effort, they really curtailed uh, the federal government's ability uh, to regulate in this field. And I think that's very significant. If you're a farmer, if you're a contractor, if you're in real estate, if you're in the energy industry, if you care about jobs in your area, what you don't want is this uncertainty of the federal government, whether your land is subject to their jurisdiction. And if you don't comply, you have penalties, $37,500 a day. I think we're getting greater clarity now to what's regulated by the feds and what's regulated by the states. And that's certainly a good thing. Patrick, thank you very much for your time this morning. We always appreciate it. Hey, thanks, guys. Appreciate it very much. Thanks, Patrick. Have a good day.